it's an oscillation process, I guess. You just have to be, you know, go out, but don't go too far and, <laughs> and then come back. Don't forget your route, right? Sure and just, you know, just keep doing that. And that process itself, I think, you know, it could be, could be very interesting. So welcome to this uh, podcast, uh, Jali, the Journeys of Scholars. You are the second Thank person. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for coming uh, to, this, to this show. So this uh, conversation is, is going to be about the trajectories, macro, micro strategies, habits, and advice that uh, various top scholars in different fields can give uh, to us, you know, others learning and, and trajectory and, and, and sort of growing. So this conversation um, is obviously uh, you know, going to be recorded, it will be out, and, and so we'll have maybe questions coming up uh, afterwards. So, uh, Jali, uh, you um, are the uh, Whipple Jones Professor of Statistics uh, at the Department of Statistics, Harvard University, and you are the, uh, also the founding editor-in-chief, the Harvard Data Science Review. Mm -hmm. uh, you are well known for various things, uh, among them in the depth and breadth uh, across various domains of statistics and methodology. I try. <laughs> and that sort of goes across the fields of, you know, multi-source, multi-phase, multi-resolution inference that you uh, uh, have uh, led uh, actually together with me, a course that we started uh, on that topic. And also statistical methods in computation, uh, you know, EM algorithm to mention one and across the various fields, not at least in astronomy and astrophysics. So it is a uh, you know pleasure to have you here, and I should also add that you know the numerous awards that you have gotten, and also the you know one hundred fifty plus publications that that you have written uh, with collaborators and yourself, and you've also gotten uh, awards for for that type of work, uh, amongst others, the best statistician under the age of forty by the committee of presidents of statistical societies. In that was last year, right? <laughs> Time flies, Jelly. Time flies. Okay. So it is truly a pleasure to have you here. So the, our first contact uh, it was back in 2019, as far as I, I remember. And it was more or less by chance. You know, chance, we like chance and statistics. And so you and I, among others, were invited to the UN Global Pulse um, and McKinsey in New York. It was a workshop. Uh, about um, uh, evaluating or using various data science techniques or just thinking in terms of data science for global development in, in general. And I knew of your work uh, already then, but I haven't met you at that point. And, and it struck me, you know, throughout the workshop, it was, uh, you know, one uh, full day that you were, you know, very active and deeply engaged in these topics. You were curious, you were, you know, reflective, interested in, in very applied topics. Things that, you know, in, in a way doesn't, you know, is not your specialization, at, 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 like in applied sense, right? So one thing that struck me that how, how, do you, how do you, you know, stay curious and open for new ideas while also making these very important, you know, contributions, deep contributions in very specialized fields? Well, thank you, first Adele, for having me and to thank you for that. That's actually a really interesting question and, and I will answer you. In a, in, in a minute, but let me reflect on the, the, the occasion that we met. And uh, the reason I was there actually is because of Harvard Data Science Review. I was uh, invited by uh, the head of the uh, president of the Future Society. And uh, he was one of the people, person that, you know, involved in organizing that, that you know, that, that data common. And I was trying to engage him to write an article for HDSR. And he told me about his UN uh, you know, initiative. And uh, I guess what led me there is exactly your question about, which is my curiosity. Um, but I find, uh, I hope this doesn't sound cliche, but I think uh, for being an academic, I think, uh, uh, you know, part of, I probably the main source of my drive is my curiosity. I just find it almost anything interesting. Now, which is actually sometimes is really pretty bad because I overwhelm myself and I just have like, nice. never get anything really done. And, and so, um, so the question you ask, uh, I think, let me rephrase a little. I think there is an interesting context there, yeah. which is that if you stay very curious all the time, mm 
Mm. How do you have time? How do you get to something deep? Exactly. Right? Because you know, depth requires you to sink more focused exactly. on a particular uh, you know, uh, you know, question. Yeah. I think I don't let me be very, you know, I think this whole conversation will be a very, very candid conversation. I'm not going to uh a shortcut anything, I think we basically try to reveal to people how sausages are made by 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 academics, right? Exactly. And, so, so I would say that my honest answer is I don't actually know how do I uh, maintain being curious, and, and I do try to spend time to think something you know as deeply as possible. The only thing I can think of, rather really on the spot. Now you put me on the spot. I not <laughs> oh, sorry about that. On this question. <laughs> But I, but I think that for me, this might be a reason that I, you know, had been engaged in this conversation called the multi-resolution, right. uh, you know, thing with you. Yeah. That I think my thinking problem itself is multi-resolution in the sense that whenever I find something curious, I ask a question, why is that? But then I go to the next question. If I answer my own question, then I ask the next question, why that is that? You know, I'm just, right. th- so my curiosity in some sense may actually lead me to think, because like almost anything, if you almost all answer to your curiosity is never complete the first time, not even complete the end time, because there's always a deep question you can ask. Right. And I think that that's probably reflects how the way I'm, you know, I'm thinking. I basically, uh, you know, for, let me give you a very simple example. Yeah, please. Uh, which has got to the study of multi-resolution, right? Because mm-hmm. I, it's about 10 years ago, I started hearing all these, uh, uh, you know, claims or hypes about now we have personalized medicine, right? Personalized the treatment. Right. So I got very curious about it, literally, right? So, wow, wow. It's like, you know, personalized. That's amazing, right? Who, who does not want that, right? Exactly. So I started looking to this, okay, how do they establish the evidence yeah. that have anything personalized? Right. Then that's at least the next question. Say, so, wait a minute, how do they, how do they do that? Right. Like, you know, I was really curious. How did they do that? Because Adele, if I can, if I tell you, said Adele, you know, I have this wonderful treatment for you. It's very effective for you. Yeah. If you, you know, have any curiosity, you will be asking, say, Charlie, how did you commit the evidence? You have not tried right. on me, right? Unless you assume me, I'm someone like anybody else. Exactly. So that's what I started thinking about. Then, of course, I realized, wait, wait, if I'm similar to other uh, other people, mm. then there's an the issue of how do you measure similarity? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, I so see. then I got a curious. I say, how do we measure similarity? Well, the concept of similarity goes, you know, really from philosophy to mathematics to mm. many places. Right. But if you really sit down to trying to define the similarity, well, good luck. Right. You know, it, it just so so. Then I started thinking about this idea of resolution, mm. right? And and then I was curious myself, saying. How far can I push this? Right. And then I end up studying, trying to look into some philosophic literature about how do you define individuality? Right. Right. You see how this one thing leads to another. Then I realized, well, I'm actually pretty deep into this whole thing, and and I started writing articles about. It. Right. But it was purely coming from a curiosity. How the hell anybody can claim that something is individualized? Right. Right. I see. Now that's a very good example. How you know this grand topic of, you know, uh, resolution or individualized uh, medicine or personalized this and that uh, sort of led you to, to ask a chain of questions that in turn led to, for, I mean, starts, starts like at the, at the beginning, like as a beginner type of question, and, uh, someone who's beginning in the field and then going deeper and deeper. And basically that depth creates um, an impetus, basically energy for, for uh, writing deeper and deeper. Right, that's sort of what I'm, I'm trying to summarize. What what you are what you are yes. uh, saying? Yes, but you also just made me re- realize that's probably is the source of more curiosity. I think yes, that, I to say that right? yeah. because you know because now I'm getting curious, and then of course once I start uh, you know launching Harvard Data Science Review, yeah. I really invite quite a few philosophers to be on board. Right, because I have these kind of a burning curiosities that how does philosophy. Think philosophers think these kind of problems, right? It's very right. messy, very yeah. kind of non mathematical, more qualitative, right? right? And, uh, but so, the, the, I mean, this the way I tend to see this, um, 
that, that you, you, you sort of, one has mentally many possibilities of generating ideas. It's, it's, it's relatively easy to generate ideas in the immaterial world compared to, you know, materializing them in the, you know, physical world, meaning that you, you sit down, you deal with, you know, all the hassles of finding time, eating, sleeping, and then getting it onto paper. So, so there's a, a lot of friction to translate all the good, great ideas that we have, you know, for every 100 idea, maybe, you, you know, we can realize, I don't know, one or two or three, depending on. <laughs> That'd be very good. <laughs> that would I, be excellent. <laughs> I, I always tell my students, like, you know, if you think about, I mean, particularly for me now, right? Because I'm, you know, I have 30 some years experience as, yeah. as, as a professional statistician. You know, usually when we think about ideas, we always need to say, well, I didn't have, I didn't write many papers. I didn't have good ideas. Yeah. But if you think about now, reflect on my 30 years career, but if I have one great idea per year, I would have so many great years, so, so many great uh, uh, ideas, and certainly I don't, right? So you know, one great idea, five years, that still gets you six really great ideas for thirty years. Right. Even, right. If you are known for six great ideas, yeah. you are a fantastic scholar, to be honest. As... Right? So, so you, you know, these ideas do not come easy. I mean, they do not come, come easy, and there's you know, plenty of training before. I mean, you know, statistics and computer science. I mean, among the you know. Um, the, the jobs that are uh, are quite uh, trendy now they they are sexy in a way <laughs> but but they are also you know to 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 actually become a statistician or computer scientist or or equivalents in engineering these stem science i mean generally the, it requires a lot of deep thinking like a deep study period right and so but so how do you how do you like from the generating the ideas i mean this is like the pre period like you know jolly maybe 20 years back and jolly today in terms of generating that momentum of creating space for deep work and deep thinking, but also not only thinking because we can generate ideas, but really getting them down and you know disciplining yourself into one discipline, which is statistics in your case. So how, you know, like just walk us through that that sort of period in your life. Sure, I mean I will continuously using the uh, personal treatment as an example because that really. Oh kind of really uh, highlights that process. Now, again, you put me on the spot to, you know, <laughs> to think about. Because once I thought about this idea of, uh, you know, think about how we as statisticians, right? Because, you know, that's where you, you can have all the while thinking. Yeah. But in the end, what you can contribute is, you know, first from your own training and to yeah. see what can I bring using my training Right. to this you know, obviously very important problem. So I started thinking about, okay, now I really want to think about how does statistics contribute to this idea of uh, evidence for personalized uh, treatment. By, by the way, uh, when I say personalized treatment, it doesn't mean just medical. Right. Uh, you have all kinds of things now being claimed to be personalized. Yeah. Right. And from things we like, like personalized treatment, uh, to like you know uh, you know personalized uh, 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 education, yeah. then two things that we probably don't like like personalized marketing, marketing like, or Netflix or maybe we like that <laughs> all the time. And the thing I think is worst is a personalized news because that basically make you they only give you the news that you like to watch, right? And yeah. that essentially is you know to be honest is what happened in this country, right? Yeah, yeah. in this crazy, country, crazy you know, bubble. Like this, everything just gets so. Diversity because everyone just watch the news state they like. But anyway, back to the whole idea of um, you know thinking about statistically. So I basically uh, the way I'm thinking about it is okay. What are the statistical ideas or concepts I can bring to help thinking this obviously important societal you know over application right? right? And uh, so the first thing I thought about is well, how have we statisticians have been contributing to the issue of collecting evidence for medical treatment, you know, before this whole claim about personalized uh, for personalized medicine, for yeah. uh, treatment. Well, the concept is a clinical trial, for example, mm. right? Yeah. You you random assign people to one group, random assign uh, people to another group, one the treatment, one the placebo, mm -hmm. maybe one is uh, older treatment, and one is a new treatment, right? right? And you're trying to compare these two groups. Right. Once I thought about that, I realized, okay, now for there, we have so much to say as a statistician because mm -hmm. the whole statistic pretty much have mm -hmm. built on the idea of collecting a sample, then trying to infer the population, yeah. so collecting samples and making comparisons, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So then I realized what I need is a concept to bring me to bring to make the 
make these uh, uh, groups, uh, these populations, smaller and smaller down to an individual, right? right. And that comes naturally, uh, the idea of resolution. Right. Now, uh, to me, part of the reason it was naturally was because I had another curiosity years ago. I was studying, I was studying with a couple of engineers about mm. All these color image. How do you make this very sharp color image? Mm. How does the camera work? Right. right? And there is you have this concept of resolution, which right. everybody understands. You know how many pixels is your camera? Yeah. Right. And and so I worked with them on this image reconstruction. You know these color sharpening. You know repairing pictures. Mm. So I learned the language there, and also learned this whole thing called the wavelets, which is essentially a a, a specific multi-resolution analysis. Right. So I thought about, okay, so now I think of what happens here, I think curiosity helps. Mm -hmm. Curiosity brought me to different applications, different areas, now helped me to kind of connect with them. So right. I started bringing the, bring the multi-resolution idea from there, started mm -hmm. to formulate. But I have to tell you, the first time I wrote the article, mm -hmm. I had this resolution as a qualitative notion. I see. And I wrote the article uh, think about this resolution uh, as a draft. Think mm -hmm. about this resolution in a qualitative way. Uh, I don't even remember what I did, but was something mm -hmm. was not quite right. When I sent to uh, a few of my great students, that's yeah. another reason academ academics like myself can do great work, because I yeah. have great students. One of them pointed to me and said, Shaoli, I got you what you want to do, but the, your statistical framework does not really work. Mm -hmm. And so I look at what you know my students said. I look at it and say, he's right. So then I sit down. Then I suddenly realize one day, well, I had some other curiosities, which I used to study pure mathematics, right? I, right. I studied all the magic theory. I studied all the sigma field, all of the stuff there. Then I realized, wait a minute, the language is there. There's all these, uh, you know, sigma field is a, a information see. filtration, allows you to build information nested, like one layer mm -hmm. up. So mm -hmm. then I brought in that language. Once I brought in this language with the multi resolution, then suddenly everything becomes crystal clear. Oh, right? And then I started writing articles. Mm -hmm. Then I started to put down and you know put down actually quite theoretical mathematical formulation. How do you how do you do that? And now it's actually being you know developed. I'm giving talks on the same. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's thanks to another student who was able to do all, all these very hard mathematics. Right. And, uh, you know, so together we, mm -hmm. we, we, we work. So that's essentially, I think, you know, for me, it's, um, it's I think it is, in some sense, all over the place because I have curious all over the place, but there is a kind of a central, um, how do you call it, you know, central hub, is right. that I, I collect all these ideas processing this kind of a statistical processing. Right. <laughs> like I was thinking about like what a statisticians can say, what can what statistical ideas, you know, can you right. know, help. And what's a language I can put there. That's that's a uh, you know very fascinating. So so I think this idea of a central hub is uh, sort of leads me to to this uh, follow up question that that when you were saying about you know the, I mean, there's a basically there's a, a risk in a way being too curious you sort of leave your field you have sort of a home training right I mean you you, you choose a field and you move on and then but that curiosity could leave like leads you to leave your field at some point if you get too curious and less interested maybe in your home field. Uh, but but you said that no, I mean you have your central hub. Basically, you you had uh, the statistical lens, the statistical perspective, so that you were processing other problems, following your curiosity, but you were trying to drive it home to your home discipline in, in a way. I'm I'm trying to sort of summarize again what what, what you were. You're, I mean you're absolutely right, but what you just said reminds me that this is a this is probably is is a testimony to this phrase called, you know, sometimes ignorance is a blessing, right. right? The reason I need to go back to the, to my home called a comfort zone is mm. because when I go too far, yeah. I realize I get lost. Yeah. But I don't understand language, just, you know, it's not my territory. I mean, I know there are historically that people can go really far and they basically occupy every place <laughs> they go, like, you know, like a von Neumann, right? You can go anywhere <laughs> they go, right? but there's only a few genius like that. You know, the, 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 you know, the rest of us, uh, you know, trying to go out yeah. and then, then, but then when I go to the boundary, I feel like that's, you know, I, I always like to explore, but when I feel it's too dangerous, yeah. in a sense that I will do nothing, I'm saying something completely stupid, yeah. I will go back to think about, okay, what is my home base? 
What right. are the things I do feel comfortable? Yeah. And I think it's interesting because that process itself mm. uh, really helped. But of course, by exploring every time I push a little bit boundary, I started to know something else a little bit more than it used to be. Right. right? right. It's it just like, so I think of probably it's an oscillation process, I yeah. guess. You just have to be, you know, go out, but don't go too far <laughs> and, and then come back. Don't forget your route, right? Oh, and just, you know, just keep doing that. And that process itself, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it could be could be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, totally, I mean, I'm, you know, as as you know myself, I have have that sort of a background where I I like to I like to explore yeah. now. Now, now, my and this is like why my question is was posed is that I can see myself sometimes venturing a little bit too far out of my home discipline, sociology or social science in general, and that makes it that makes it sometimes a little hard to know exactly where you know what what ideas can you actually take back because you've sort of found these ideas maybe to be uh, even more interesting than perhaps what your home field has in some core core elements and so yeah. this is obviously uh, um you know uh, uh sort of a digestion period between you and the field but also the field itself uh, yeah. and so and so maybe you know i mean uh, statistics why why did that become your constant Shelley? so so you could have you know with your curiosity i mean and i can imagine you know when you were you know 15 or 20 you were sort of curious about the i mean you choose mathematics and and then you ended up in well, ended up. I wouldn't say you sort of, sort of still. And taking... it was the right words. And it was actually right, really right. Exactly. Words. You know, <laughs> at, at that time, you know, we started as a, I started as a pure mathematician. Yeah. Uh, uh, not because I really knew anything about mathematics. It's very, very interesting. This. Okay. This, this is a, this is a side story, but but it, but it's worth. Seeing. Yeah. Let's let's go for it. We can go back but to this. This side. is this is worth telling. This shows the impact of the media on the young minds. Okay. Okay. So I think that actually. For us as the educators, that they do have real implications. Right. right? Yeah. The reason at the time that me and the many, many youngsters mm. become mathematicians, become pure mathematicians, uh -huh. is because of one single article uh, in the in the Chinese newspaper by this by this uh, reporter. He mm. wrote this kind of a story about this one Chinese mathematician uh -huh. uh, who you know sacrificed his own house. Uh, went through the you know the the hard time of cultural revolution, uh -huh. but persisted to study this problem called the one plus one equal to two. Uh, I, I <laughs> okay. don't know how, much you, how much you ever heard about that? I've I've actually studied a bit of mathematical philosophy, right. so I, I think right, I right. Know. But but yeah, this go is for it. The, go for it, please explain. Right. This is not the origin of one plus one plus two. By the way, that actually takes pages pages to prove. Yeah. Know, from, from the axiomatic perspective, but right. this this was res with respect to so called the. Uh, 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 let me see if I still remember the term correctly. I think it's called a Gurdmaha conjecture, okay. right? The, the Gurdmaha conjecture says every even number larger than six can be written as the sum of two prime numbers. Right. Okay. Mm. That turned out to be. I mean, you can verify any even number you you can think of. There's always a way of right. of doing that. But mm. turned out to be incredibly hard to prove. Yeah. 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 So what uh, this particular mathematician, his name is uh, Chen Jingren, what he was able to prove at the time was regarded as really this jewel on his crown in this field, mm -hmm. which I think still is, is that he was uh, able to prove that every even number is a sum of one prime plus the product, no more than the product of two primes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a slightly less. But the story was that, that of course, you know, we as youngster mind at the time is very curious, right? Talk mm. about curiosity. Yeah. My mind, my brain is absorbing anything. Right. And you know, at the time, just revolution, retro revolution just ended in China, yeah. and which stopped the high education for 10 years. Mm. You have so many very hungry, craving young minds out right. there. Yeah. And right. when this newspaper article, this this is nothing like any other article there, we yeah. all read it. We all feel like, oh, wow, wow, wow. you know, nice. this is the, this is the achievement. This is something that you right. don't need anything else. You just need a brain and, and a pencil, a paper. Right. Yeah. To achieve. That was fascinating. So that's I decided to uh, study mathematics. Mm. And uh, I tell you that you know at the time the Chinese had this called a call, meaning the national entry exam for the for getting to college, mm. which which was renewed. And uh, I was you know one of them to take these exams. Wow. And, and then you need to feel where you want to go. Every department I want to go, I put out mathematics because I was. <laughs> so we ended up having a mathematical department has 200 
over 200 you know students okay uh, one class one class one class 200 students yeah, yeah. because we are all they are determined to be pure mathematicians wow so, yeah, that's, that's so fascinating that's, that's how that I started but the reality then becomes you know yeah. Uh, first, you know, uh, not everyone can do pure mathematics. Right. And the second is probably the world does not need this many pure mathematicians. <laughs> we also need some other people. Right. And so I study quite a bit of pure mathematics. I study algebra, abstract algebra. Mm. But I, during the time, this talk about curiosity, now I think about that probably was the ultimate curiosity led me to statistics. Okay. I took uh, seven courses mm. in probability, stochastic processing, Mm. Anything about a randomness. And I got a completely fascinated by the idea, by the concept that mm. you can use precise mathematics right. to describe random phenomena. Right. Because <laughs> at that time, this is actually there's a key distinction. Yeah. At that time, my thinking about randomness, just like now, most people think about randomness. People think about randomness as like a haphazardness. Right. You know? Exactly. Just chaotic, right? No structure. No structure, basically. No structure. So that's why that's why I did not understand how mathematics can describe randomness. Because right. the randomness in mathematics the way, as, as you know well, probability is yeah. very structured. Yeah. Right? yeah. So everybody has equal chance, so you have that's a distribution, it's an incredible structure. It is that structure mm. allows you to study them mathematically. Right. But it depends how you apply that structure, the thing can be very useful. Right. So for me, I decided getting to, or I, I didn't have to decide because my curiosity kind of just like a drag me into it. You know, <laughs> you, you ask a question like sometimes, how do you go too far? I said, yeah, that's that's case, probably I went too far because I was doing pure from algebra, but I dra gradually get dragged into yeah. just getting probability. Then eventually, you know, I never yeah. returned. You right? got sucked in. <laughs> so, but, uh, so, you know, maybe maybe that's the way that you never get to drag too far because whenever you drag too far, you stay, that mm -hmm. becomes your home base. Right. And, Right. So uh, that's how I, you know, getting. That's to that's absolutely fascinating, and and these, I mean, this this trajectory of of yours. I mean, there's there's this personal level uh, of it that is, is is so interesting to hear about. You know, you, the fascination of you know your your sort of your mind dragging you into this direction, and then eventually from pure into uh, statistics, pure mathematics into st mathematical statistics, and, and then and then eventually. So so what. You know, I mean, at some point in your career, you know, I mean, that this we can see in your CV that you 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 went from a bachelor in, in China and then you went to to study in the U.S. And so, what what was you know what was the main sort of um, uh, decision making process behind behind that? Sure. Uh, well, I guess you have another three hours for me. <laughs> 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 uh, we can you know, go as long as you time, want. You're right. At that time, you know, we uh, we started. China just started to open up, and there are these possibilities of study abroad. Yeah. And obviously, you know, uh, U.S. has all these, you know, great universities. Yeah. I mean, the other country has great universities too, but you know, U.S. always sure, yeah, kind of shines the, a bit the, extra. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the uh, this this attractor, hmm. and uh, I gradually had, uh, uh, you know colleagues and also classmates, um, you know, came to the United States to study. Mm. How I decided to come here was, again, one of those things, I think, led by my curiosity, because mm. uh, um, in my last year, uh, well, first of that, once I graduated from college in, in China, graduated from Fudan University, I was assigned to uh, China Textile University, mm. uh, to teach, uh, uh, you know, basic uh, mathematics, okay. and and then I uh, uh, had the opportunity to return to Fudan to study uh, to get a master kind of a, a degree. Uh, mm. It's actually technically it's a master program. They don't issue a degree at yeah. the time. A master program to continue to study what what we call mathematical statistics. Right. Which is essentially the stuff you know, all the asymptotics, yeah. rule of admissibility, or right all stuff. But just at the last year when I was there, um, one of my classmates, who after graduated from college, went to the Chinese, you know, uh, Chinese Academy of Science. Mm. He did a master there, but then he came to see me, uh, tell me that he's, you know, he said goodbye. He's going to the uh, U.S. to study statistics mm. at the at the Purdue University. Okay. And so I congratulated him. Yeah. And uh, I said, oh, great that you can go out. You know, so I. So I was curious. There's again mm -hmm. a curiosity. I say, how did you get the funding to study? Do you have like a you know rich uncle or rich <laughs> right. in the US? 
He said, no. He said, I don't have any body in the U.S. Really? I said, wait, wait. If you don't have any body in the U.S., how would you? How would you do it? Yeah. He said, very easy. You apply. You apply. <laughs> what? What? You know, you apply to get it. He said, yeah. He said, I can teach you how to apply. You see how I can oh, into myself into trouble? Yeah. And he said, the first thing you do is go to university to get your transcript. I remember you had to pay, pay, pay three Chinese yuan to get a transcript. He said, right. well, get the transcript, then I teach you how to do it. So mm -hmm. I, I went. Again, I had, I had no idea what I was doing. It's just kind of a curiosity. When you're young, you mm -hmm. see your classmate went out. You might talk about the peer kind of a, you know, uh, in, in inference, right? Right. So I went and I, you know, get the transcript. Then he taught me. He said, the way you apply, he said, you know, just write him a letter. But he, he told me that the way you apply is you need to apply to, you need to apply to these schools that, you know, you, you, you really want to go, but you also have, should have some safe bet. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if you can go, but maybe then also apply to a few. You know, you probably have no chance. But if you're gonna get in, that'd be great, right? right. That's okay. So, so what that would be? You yeah. know? So that was a harbor, right? <laughs> so you know, in China at the time, the harbor has such a big name, right? Yeah. So I applied to a bunch of other university, which I would not mention other university because I don't want to. Uh, you know, <laughs> exactly. Here. Yeah. But, you know, long story short, that's eventually is how I get to. Uh, I applied and. For some strange reasons that the, my own department, you know, they think I was uh, uh, good enough. Right. And so they, at the time, there was very few Chinese students. Right. Uh, being admitted. And this was this was in the late eighties, nineteen. Nineteen eighties. I applied nineteen eighty five. I got in nineteen eighty six. Eighty six. Okay. Okay. Wow. Wow. And then yeah. And then there was you know then then basically the rest is history. You you sort of that was a trajectory. Then the rest is well. It's a long history, but. And so going back to this sort of idea of, of um, well, going back to the world of ideas. So when you, uh, when you arrive in the U.S., I mean, you have, you know, you've studied mathematics, pure mathematics, you went into mathematical statistics, and then you came to Harvard. And then, you know, you had to choose a, a topic. And I know that Don Rubin was your uh, supervisor. Wow. Um, uh, and, and so, so how was, you know, what was, walk us through a little bit uh, this curiosity again and, and selecting an idea. Again, because there are so many ideas. Why did you in, end up doing, you know, what you did in, in your in your thesis? Yeah, well, actually, I mean, that was a really, I think if I talk about the impact of education, obviously, my education at the Fudan University, I particularly thank my calculus professor and also algebra professor, they taught me so well. If we have time, I can <laughs> get into the story later about the importance of having good education style. Right. No one particular style, two of them have very different styles and yeah. have but, but, but taught me well. Mm -hmm. But uh, once I got to Harvard, um, the thing now you're talking about, you know, you, you said that your curiosity can drive you, can bring you very far. And I realized when I get, you know, I thought I was, uh, you know, reasonably pre prepared for the courses there. Right. Uh, but of course, I also understand, you know, Harvard is Harvard, all these courses will be uh, will be, uh, you know, they're very challenged. So yeah, I'm kind yeah. of mentally prepared to do that. And uh, you may remember the same friend, uh, you know, went to Purdue. Mm. When I got here, the first thing I need to do is to, uh, it's a really long story. I have many, so many stories to tell, but let me <laughs> simplify uh, simplify these stories. That We have time, uh, Jolly. Please, we have time. The first no, thing no I need to do, oh, be careful, be careful. <laughs> I, I can give 10 hour speeches. <laughs> well, we can do a follow up at some point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but one thing I have to, I need to do, and then that is probably a good advice to all um, students, particularly foreign students coming to a different country. Um, so I need to choose courses, right? Mm. Okay. I don't know how to choose courses because all the courses looks interesting and I have right. no idea their level because they're all English. My English then was very, very poor. Right. Um, so I called my friend at Purdue. Uh -huh. and, and so I asked his advice. He gave me a, a very good advice. Um, he, he said, well, he said, well, you choose some courses are easy and some courses are hard. Oh, okay. Trying to, trying to balance out, right? That, that is, a, you know, it sounds like a trivial idea, but it is a good advice. The only problem that he did not tell me which courses are easy and which courses are hard. <laughs> right, exactly. Principle works well, but... And, and, and the, here's what I... That was my true education. So I look at these courses. There was a course called the linear regression. Mm -hmm. I have taken three linear regression courses in China. Mm. Right, I went through all these uh, hard, you know, 
uh, uh, you know, algebras for yeah. proving things, right? So, so I said, well, how hard is a linear regression? You just draw a line. Right? How <laughs> hard is that, you know, that will be? Then I said, okay, so that would be my easy course. Oh, uh, you're <laughs> okay. You probably know what's what's coming. Exactly. And I said, what would be the hard course? Well, there is a course called the a probability theory. Okay. Right. Right. So I said, well, you know, probability theory, a theoretical course is always hard. And you know, I've I've taken seven kind of a theoretical courses in China. So I, but I thought, you know, here's Harvard, right? They you know these professors might teach them. So I said, that's my hard course. That's your hard. <laughs> Guess what happened then? It was the reverse <laughs> probably. <laughs> the complete suspicion. Interesting. In the property theory, they used a book by uh, Kalai Chong from Stanford. It's a wonderful book. But I, during the time I was preparing for coming to US, I read the whole thing. Partly was training my English. Yeah, I did all the homework, very much like what you did with a uh, Joe Blisting's book, right? Exactly, exactly. Every homework I do things, yeah. so I know the thing inside out, right? Yeah. yeah. And I was not only trying to answer the question because I was trained as a pure mathematician. Yeah. You know, for, for pure mathematician, the issue is not to get the proof right. Getting proof right does not give you hundred percent markers if you send that to your professor. It's to get the most elegant. Most no. succinct proof, most see. logic, most crystal, most beautiful proof. Elegance, right? elegance. Yeah. That's what I was doing it when I was doing homework. Right. Guess what happened? The professor was teaching that course, who is a professor, Shahalo. I just went to uh, yeah. Columbia, uh, celebrated his 70th birthday, and I just told this story yeah. you know, to, to the party. He basically, he was, he basically was so impressed by the way I answered the homework. He basically ditched the TA's answer, <laughs> he, he distributed my answer to, to everybody else. Okay. That's how you do it. You know, because he, he came from Taiwan. He had he had similar trainings. Oh, he I was see. very frustrated for people who don't have the mathematical training. Right. Writing these proofs is not really proof. They just right. like trying to do things like so. So he was he was completely he said, Wow, you know, here's the proof. This so is how I, you do it. I did extremely well in probability theory. Mm -hmm. Guess what happened with regression course? Well, in regression course, first I have to actually run some regression. You know, in China, that like education I had then, I did a lot of theoretical course. Yeah. We never was told, we never even, you know, run, we never had the data set to uh, run the regression. All theoretical. All location, right? Yeah. Okay. So when I start doing the linear regression, you you must have experienced on linear regression. Yeah. So one thing they tell you is how to check the model fitting, but mm -hmm. you look at the residual plot, yeah. and if you see any funny shape, the fan shape or some shape, then you need to transfer the variables, right? right. Transfer X, transfer Y. Yeah. So I look at the book, book tell me, if you see this shape, transfer X. I transfer the X. Once I transfer X, some other shape will come out. Then said, you need to transfer Y. I transfer Y. And look <laughs> at it, then, then another shape comes out. Yes. So I keep doing transferring. I transfer in both, right? Yeah. Of course, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I was, this is, this is yeah. tell you the, how terrible it is if you just study is statistic as rules, but right? I'm right. literally just looking at the rules. That's what my, my mathematical thinking was going, right? Mm -hmm. Rules, and I can never fix the problem. Guess what happens? Mm -hmm. The homework was due, and what I did is I just plot all, I plot all these output, 100, 100 pages output, yeah. and I just hand it to the professor, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I had no idea what I was doing, and I said, "Here's my homework." Here's your homework. Oh, uh, that professor is actually uh, later become my friend. Uh, he also graduated from. Uh, he was a student of R. Dempster. Mm -hmm. He's now a professor of uh, genetics and statistics at Oxford mm -hmm. University, Augie mm -hmm. Augie Kong. Nice. Uh, you know, I always remind that story. He he probably didn't. I don't remember. He <laughs> called me to his office. He said, "Charlie, explain to me what you have done." <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's I. I basically don't know what to say because I had no idea what I was doing. I was just saying I follow the books, I change the rules, I can never get this thing done. I right. can never get this done. Right. So, and he was so frustrated. I was very frustrated. You know what saves me in the end, because my English was so poor, and you know he he speak he only speak Cantonese. He cannot speak Mandarin with me. Right. And then my English is so poor that and I was like a struggling. Student. <laughs> He eventually dismissed me, said, Charlie, just go away. <laughs> <laughs> so my my lack of language saved me. <laughs> saved you in the end. But so that, that was a, that was a really a, a great lesson, you know, to make a long story short, that I really went through this process, uh, completely changed the way I'm thinking about, you know, what's hard, what's easy, but the deep question, 
is what is the big picture? Why do you, why, what do you, what you're doing? Right. Now, I have to say that is the entire graduate process. Mm. If anyone asks me like, what was the point you study, you, you, you start to kind of have the maturity mm. uh, to see things statistically, my honest answer is I don't know. I don't think there was a single moment. Yeah, yeah. It's a fluid. But, right. But, but, but I do tell you that I do have one more story to tell. I have a zilling story to tell. That a retrospectively, I think, was a sign that I start to get it. The difference between statistical thinking and mathematical thinking. Right. It was a qualifying exam, mm. right? Because you know, all PhD need a qualifying exam. Yeah. yeah. There was one problem was given by my thesis advisor, Don Rupert, right? Mm. And he gave this problem is on multiple imputation, some hypothesis testing. During the limited time I have, I don't know how to solve that problem. I really don't because mm. I know this, the math is too hard, you know. To, so I said, well, he asked me to test the hypothesis. I cannot test the hypothesis that uh, he wants me to, the problem specify. Mm. But I can test a different hypothesis, mm -hmm. which is related. If I can prove that hypothesis wrong, this one will be wrong. But mm. if that one is, cannot be proven wrong, I don't know what, what to say. About right, this. okay. If I cannot solve this one, I decided, I wrote down how I would test the other one. Okay. It turned out to be the other one was wrong. Okay. So I can conclude this one was wrong, right? I okay. see, I see. So, so, but I was, in, I, I thought I was in shaky ground because I know I did not solve the original problem he wants me to, to solve. Oh, I see, okay. okay. But guess what happened? That was the thing. When the uh, qualified exam problems, you know, uh, score, uh, the, the grades come, come, up, come out, I would have won, get the highest one. I, oh. the highest, I, had, a, I had another like uh, 0.5 points higher than another person. Well done. It did the well do. And yeah. the other guy was saying, like, what's going on here? Right. So the other guy went to Ruben yeah. to ask. And I went to Ruben to ask. I said, Down. I said, No, I have actually I didn't call him Down. It's called Professor Ruben then. I, said, <laughs> Professor, I did not solve the problem you asked me to solve. Right. Why do I get the high score? Yeah. And he said, You don't understand. That was my intention. That was your intention. Yeah. It's not solvable. I want to see who had the idea, can think more broadly. Solve in this uh, 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 zigzag way. Beautiful. So that was in, in intended. So later, when I become a dean, one of my speeches to to the graduate students as yeah. an advice to them, I said, you know, anytime you cannot solve the problem, change it. <laughs> I got a great laugh. But I think that actually later, I think that you you interviewed uh, uh, you know Gary King, right? Yes. Yeah. One of uh, Gary's, you know. Uh, of secret weapon. I was going to say, change the question, change the question. So change the question, change the way you can solve because, you know, the, it, there are some really choose to it because sometimes that's how you tackle these really hard problems. You right. still keep the origin problem in mind, you right. graduate. It's like uh, that, uh, it's like uh, that, you know, uh, that, that, you know, that go bar conjecture, right? Yeah. He cannot prove the origin of one plus one. He probably proves one plus two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make, a, you make a progress that way. That's, that's, I have so many questions now. <laughs> I don't know which direction to go, but, but, but the, but the one, but the one direction that, that perhaps, you know, we, we should, we should pursue and maybe we can come back to, to, to the trajectory of yours, which is hard. I mean, the hard problems, and this is, I think this is very important because also, as you mentioned, Gary, Gary takes up this, this thing that you should change the question if, if you can't change the, if you can't answer the, the original one. Um, so my, my re response was, and I, th I think, you know, you should definitely adapt, but, but what's, what's, what's the internal logic in terms of pursuing a hard question versus changing it? I mean, in this exam that you, exam, example that you gave us, it was impossible probably to solve uh, because, you know, Don has set it up like that. Right. But in real life, in your research, what, how do you, you know, how do you navigate uh, changing the question versus attacking the hard question that, you know, might be the million dollar question? Sure. Sure. Well, you know, obviously we should have qualified the statement that if you can't solve the problem, change it because then then the world will be too easy, right? Everyone would change the question. Right, right. I mean, so 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 the real real essence essence for thinking that way, the goal is still to solve the original problem. Mm. But if it's too hard, right, mm. that you might be able to solve part of the problem. You might be able to solve the related problem. That right. first that Related problem might be worth solving because it was inspired by the hard problem. Oh, so, that's a good point. Number yeah. one, number two, you are making progress, mm. right? So you know this is this is this is how this is actually really in a way is really more engineer kind of 
thinking, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. If you can solve a big problem, you modulize. You say which part I can solve, right? Right? Which part you can. So, so that that is the problem solving skill. Mm. It's not to change the origin problem and say complete abolish the origin problem. Right. It's rather to 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 kind of gradually talking about red revolution, <laughs> multi face. You are you are building a process to succeed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And at some point, you may realize there are some things like you know you you go from all different angles. I mean, mm. it's really like climbing climbing the mountain, right? right? You know, if I want to climb the the, the top stone, I really cannot get there. I see there is another peak next to it, yeah. right? Maybe I can get there first. I can even take a look. You know what the other peak looks like. <laughs> right. And go down. Right. You 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 keep doing that, but but you never forget. I see. Right. What the what the original problem is. I mean, you think I, I think if you look at how the how the this is probably part of thinking is also mathematical thinking. Right, but right. in mathematics, when we're trying to prove a theorem, when it's too hard, guess what? You say, well, let me add a, a, add a condition, right? Yeah. If I added this condition, things become easier. Well, anytime you're adding a condition, you're changing the problem. The origin problem did not have that condition, right? right? right. But yeah. once you keep adding it to a point, mm. you, they're, they're, they're basically, uh, uh, you know, there are two routes there. When you're adding a condition, at some point, you may actually discover the mm. origin problem is not possible. Right, because you are already adding what it call the if and only if condition, right? right. You realize so. You, sometimes people prove those things essentially become mm. they want to prove a conjecture. Mm. When they keep cannot prove it, they eventually realize the project cannot be proved. Then they give a counter example. Oh, I see. Okay, so that's basically right. Yeah. right. All they can prove is the conjecture is true if and only if this is true. But that one I know. Therefore, I know that one cannot be true. I but see. that one has more. That one has more restrictions, um, right? So, so that's all the way when I talk about you know uh, talk about changing the problems. Mm. And so I. But also there's a really practical side, right? You know, it's just like this is both the good part and the bad part of the academic academic system. We need to get promoted. You need the papers to get out. Yeah. And you <laughs> sit there. I mean, unless you're a mathematician, because they have a culture that allow you to sit there for ten years. Yeah, it's really, really, really deep thinking, right? Yeah, but you still need to produce the results. So, so you need to learn, you know, how do you produce the results that in itself will be very useful? Mm. You're not solving the problem, but you acknowledge which problem you have not been solved and right. not been solved. You also can, you know, when I write an article, I always write it in the, in the last section, say something about the future work limitations. Yeah, but you also uh, allow others that who are probably smarter than you, who who have more ideas, who have, can can help to solve the problem, right? right. That's how I see how the research program. It's almost, I mean, Gary is really right. It's a very rare in statistic, the problem you you you, you intend to solve is the one you end up solving, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you, know, you know, exactly, because right. lots of things in statistics, and in social science particularly, I shouldn't say just mm-hmm. mm-hmm. social science that you know too well, lots mm-hmm. of, you know, the vast majority of research, am I correct, is to formulate the question correctly, <laughs> formulate the problem correctly. So, yeah. You both have a frame, you can solve yeah. it, and it's relevant, yeah. but you don't try to solve it. Hey, solving the poverty, you know, let's just solve the poverty. Well, that's, we all wanted to do that, right? How exactly. Do you do that? exactly, exactly. I mean, that's sort of, uh, you know, I mean, um, in a way, you know, that's that's a really interesting contrast, but, you know, solving poverty in, in social science, very, very few people would, in social science, social scientists would say that because they know that's sort of a impossible problem, if you see what I mean. Whereas, but the funny part is that if you say I'm solving cancer, you know, I mean, then I mean, very few people would, at least you know, with my you know, with sort of understanding, would say that's you know something we see as impossible. It's very hard. Maybe it's an impossible thing. I don't know. Uh, but it, but it seems to me that certain things are, uh, depending on the discipline, are you know possible or impossible depending on the sort of the nature of the problem. That actually is a really good point. Like the, all these big problems, right? You know, we all want the world peace, you know, yeah. solving poverty, yeah. control the climate, and all mm-hmm. the stuff. All these problems are really truly unsolvable by any single discipline. Right. right? Yeah. It's yeah. all so every discipline is trying to contribute to what they can. So right. when they, when you do that, you actually already modify the mm-hmm. generic problem mm-hmm. into a domain, something you're familiar with, you can contribute. Right. Right. So we're all trying to, you know. So 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 maybe uh, maybe a better phrase to say if you cannot solve a problem, change your problem would be if you cannot solve a problem, solving a part of it. Sorry, a part of part of it. Yeah, exactly. And this this is I mean this is terrific because this also leads me to to the sort of the next theme, which is you know problems 
also cross disciplines as you as you're mentioning and and then you know collaboration is then obviously one one key thing and i know that you are you know collaborating cross disciplines across different you know with astronomers with social scientists like me people in medicine engineers and so on and so forth so how do you how do you um because I mean, if you think about an idea being, say, poverty or, or cancer or, you know, whatnot, uh, where, where did the universe come from? Basically, you know, this what astrophysicists are, are partially thinking about. What's the, like, how do you organize uh, yourself, yourself, but also your collaborators in terms of that common goal? I mean, it seems a bit hard sometimes because they have different sort of uh, standards, but also different journals and different cultures of, of working. So yeah that that's definitely another 10 hours conversation because <laughs> uh, i've worked i i have worked with quite a few you know disciplines you know and so uh but i think that this is a in a way you know again i'm just thinking on a spot that mm. uh, goes back to what we talk about how how my curiosity brings me to different things but i always come back to my exactly yeah. Yeah. because for me uh, lots of these projects started with one thing in common and then you know this thing too well that that happened in social science all the time is missing data right, right? exactly okay so yeah. the thing is like because part of my thesis working with don rubin as you know he's the world expert on missing data yeah. that i work on em algorithm obviously is dealing with missing data i want more on multiple interpretation hmm. i even worked with shaw hollow you know uh, you many people don't know uh, Shohua was my second thesis advisor mm. on survival analysis, right. on sensor data. Right, right, right. right. So, so in, in fact, my thesis title was uh, "Towards Compute Results for Incomplete Problems." <laughs> that's, all my, that's a perfect topic, guys. <laughs> uh, Towards Compute Results for Incomplete Data. I think that's that's forever sets how my uh, uh, my career will be because right. first you never complete technically. There's always incomplete data. There's always. But, a but, but but the thing is because everybody has missing data, everybody kind of a you know build a reputation that I work on missing data. So everybody says, actually already come to help me like to mm. so that was my common thread, you know, goal. And mm. then, and and then, and the other thing is that one time there's something asked me, say, Charlie, like you know, you walk into like any rooms like with any of these group, like you always have seems like can ask some intelligent questions. <laughs> like, like how much do you know all this stuff? I say, you know. <laughs> I tell the truth, right? I know very little about anything. But the reason I can always ask some intelligent question is because yeah. there, are, there are just not too many principles in statistics. First, number one, mm -hmm. bias variance trade-off is always a one. <laughs> Second is that all these problems, anytime you deal with missing data, there's a, there's a universal question, universe question you can ask mm. is why do you have the missing data? Right. What, what What's the reason for that? Yeah. Because that question itself immediately leads into both the more deep state of thinking because you know people tend to just analyze whatever data they have they yeah. forgot the missing data kills you because missing data is a selection mechanism right, right. as you know right yeah. the second that question immediately engage my collaborator to talk about the real substantive part because they need to explain mm. how the missing happens right. people did not respond the instrument did not work mm. so you suddenly start to learn what the substantive thing is just like when i work with you Right. right, you know, random dislocation, the countries of survey data, you know, you immediately step. So, so right. become a very natural way to engage in, in these conversations. Mm. So my advice for anyone wants to engage with a lot of collaborators is to build something is yourself. You do become experts, uh, but, you know, find something that you, the question asked will both relevant and also will start to engage the other side to tell you what they're thinking. They have to, because otherwise I cannot understand why this thing's missing. Mm -hmm. During the process, then I start to learn a lot. I see. I see. Right? And I can tell you that I work with my as, as, as astronomers. I have built this thing. I even wrote an article about it, if you want to read it. Yeah, uh, I would love to read it. Uh, the article is con uh, highly conduct highly principled data science. Mm -hmm. And I have a, and I really have a specific way to say, what do I mean? Highly principled. The the number one here by highly principled, I said, you know, the problem you work on should not be just scientifically motivated. Mm. It has to be scientifically principled. Right. Scientifically motivated these days is is too easy. Almost any problem you work on has a real substance there. Yeah. But being scientifically motive motive uh, principled, I realized one thing. 
that we statisticians, I'm sure as a social scientist, you can do that too. Mm. I find that by post question to my collaborator, like astrophysicists, I actually also help them to think deep about their their discipline. Oh yeah, you know, that sounds like a very very kind of obnoxious statement, but but it actually is really true because here's what happens: anytime they give me data, they mm -hmm. know I'm not an astronomer, I'm not an astrophysicist, mm -hmm. right? So they clean the data for me, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but I, I was I knew enough that they have cleaned enough that sometimes you know it's not exact the question they want to answer. Oh, Talk about they change the question, right? right? So they would tell me, for example, I was working on this thing called a. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 collaborations of, of instrument. Hmm. The instrument always deteriorate over the time. They need to, hmm. you know, re recalibrate. Right. right? And it, that become an interesting problem. But they always tell me like, oh, they know what the, what, what the, this, uh, how they, how they this calibrate. They say, oh, yeah, so we know that. Well, I know for sure, I have ex enough experience. They don't really know for sure. They estimated themselves, but hmm. they did not want me to worry about that part. So they need to tell me, say, we know that. But I have experience enough. I'm also yeah. senior enough. So yeah. I can ask her the question. I particularly, you know, Vinay is my collaborator. I say, Vinay, like, you know, what did you hide from me? Like, like is, is this really no? Then he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know we, we simplify. Okay, then I start pushing. Then he said, Charlie, that's a question we really want to solve. We actually don't really know. Can you do that too? And I said, well, I don't know if I can do that, but we can work together. So I've done so many times that I'm pushing. I ask questions. They start to say, oh, this actually can be done differently, right? They, because every field, as you know, you're working in social science, you know well, how many times you have to simplify things? Yeah. How many times you will say, well, let's just, you know, put that, yeah, yeah. Right? Because I have a big problem to solve. Yeah. But if you're a good collaborator, mm. you should help not only solving the problem they present mm. and ask the question and, and push them to solve the problems they really wanted to solve, right. not to simplify the one for you. Right. Right, right. That's a that's a terrific advice, and and so how, so this is this by this is again your curiosity coming through. You're asking questions again in a way that you're curious about their field. You have your expertise, obviously, and I think that's you know one of the one of the questions I had is this sort of you know when you go solo, when you go collaborative in an article, and it sounds like you know you have you have certain deep questions and statistics that you are interested in and continue to be interested in missing data amongst many different um, topics but so you you try to like walk us through like how much in terms of statistical contributions i mean now you know i mean this is also probably a difference between you today and jolly 20 years ago or 30 years ago when you had to prove yourself right now now you're proven and you can collaborate more with your students but perhaps if you think about back in the days like how would you know how would you how would you approach collaboration in your discipline versus collaboration across disciplines. Right. Well, you know, the 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 way I did it again, you know, lots of things happened kind of organically. I got into the astronomer, uh, you know, astro staff, mm. really because uh, actually my first student from Chicago, David Van Dyke, who, uh, you know, after he graduated, he joined Harvard and he, I think it was starting by 1997, mm. he, uh, at by the with the introduction of of of, of Don, mm. he was uh, introduced to a couple of astronomers from I should call them astrophysicists. They have distinction between astronomy and astrophysicists. Right, okay, yeah. that, uh, uh, from Smithsonian, you know, uh, uh, at you know at Harvard. Yeah, and so they started to work on and they built a, you know this annual workshop. Mm. So by the time I joined Harvard and and after a few years, uh, David was. Uh, was leaving mm. that I felt like it, it would be a shame to let the collaboration, you know, die. And I yeah. did not know anything about astrophysics whatsoever, mm -hmm. seriously. <laughs> and but I but I know enough about what the David is doing on the MCMC, yeah. Bayesian modeling. So I said, well, it's a learning opportunity for me. Yeah. And so I basically started working with them. Nice. And now we have worked there since ninety. Because now it's like a tw almost twenty years. Wow! Yeah. Over the time we we uh, we developed a lot of stuff, mm. and in fact, I the, the best part for me was uh, was that I developed a couple of methodologies uh, mm. because of the work in astrophysics. Ah, I see. So into weaving strategy, mm. purely trying to solving mm. uh, uh, you know astronomy problem, mm. and then with another wonderful students, and then we realized that itself has has. Uh, 
you know, legs, so to speak, that can apply to, to other fields. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think uh, uh, to make really the long stories, I have really, really many long stories mm -hmm. short, the, the essential part of for me is that my ultimate interest here certainly started, um, now I have a little bit more than that. Uh, started from my ultimate interest was all, always, this is what statistician do is like, uh, can I develop a methodology that not only useful for solving the problems mm -hmm. that I'm told to solve, I give yeah. to solve, but the, that strategy the method would be useful for other problems. So that's what, the, that's what the difference between, I would say, a statistician or maybe a data scientist in the sense of a data scientist want to solve the problem and stay in that interdisciplinary. For me, I'm moving around I because I, you know, I will, you know, I will be developing, developing, developing methodologies. Right. And but now the added layer to it, as you probably can tell from our joint course. And thank mm -hmm. you again for the wonderful collaboration. Well, it's all my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I I am now trying to also thinking about not just the methodology, thinking about. What are the theoretical thinking? What's the foundational thinking? What are the philosophical thinking behind it? And how those things itself mm -hmm. can not only help other domains, mm -hmm. but how that can help deepen the statistical thinking mm -hmm. foundation that is relevant for general data science. Mm -hmm. Right. right? Yeah. So that's, I mean, the reason I formulate this multi resolution, multi phase, multi source is trying to really put in more structure from mm. a statistical perspective, mm. but not uh, purely for for statisticians, right. but for the general data science. Right, right. Like this idea of how do you take into account a problem that has been worked on by multiple groups? It's a much more sociological question. Yeah, it is. Question. Very much. How do they impact to it, right? Yeah. So that's how I, I mean, I also want to really learn a lot more from you to help me to think about when you have this human aspect into, you mm. know, the one thing I want to push, which that's another topic I am not, Actually, I don't think I've mentioned that to you yet. Uh, <laughs> I would love to have you to work with me on it. Is what I call the behavioral statistics. Oh, okay. Like yeah. very, you know, Sounds... How do you take how do you take into account people's behavior in your statistical model? Right, right, right. Okay, yeah, that's basically almost like the 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 meta of the sociology of data science, right? So you have this sociology of of, of X is usually you know how does people uh, collaborate, compete, uh, you know, use resources to you know outdo each other or collaborate and build things uh, but right. the meta part of that is that how do you encode that into the modeling basically that's what you that's what i think you're trying to say right, <laughs> right. but 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 i want to i want to push to even the higher level in the following sense i want the methodology to anticipate the person will misuse it. even anticipate it. okay okay i see Right. right. So the methodology should be like, you know, the methodology should be taking into account the, mm. the analyst behavior. Right. Right. So you now we talk of robustness to model. I want the robust to the, the kind of abusive use. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, you know, it's, you know, it's possible. This, this yeah. is basically why you want this, mm. why you want this algorithm to be interpretable. Yeah. Because that's people, when they, they can interpret, right. they have less oh, chance to do it. Right. There's all the whole things like if you mm. really get into it, it will change the way you actually present this model methodology. That's actually you know, very interesting. This is what I this is what I call the principle of corner cutting, right. right? Because you you cut the corner to make the methodology more robust mm. or less to be abused. Because the end result is better than right. you trying to push the great methods, but nobody knows how to use it. That's fascinating. But I want I want that to be a quantitative process. Right. <laughs> like, I want that to be a statistical thinking. Exactly. Not exactly. A qualitative I mean, statement. Yeah. Right? How do you do that? How do you do that? I think that's that sounds that sounds so fascinating. I haven't thought about like how do you <laughs> how do you not only analyze it sociologically but actually incorporate it statistically, which totally. is like, so you have an impact. Yeah, but exactly. You know, so totally qualitatively. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. You do like, is there a component like a, yeah. is, is there a component can take into account the uncertainty due to the due to the analyst behavior? Exactly. You know, maybe the methodology, like like we we'll do the multi mutation, we we'll say impute it in three different ways. Right. Well, that probably can capture some of the thinking. Yeah. 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 I, this is this is so fascinating. So we should, you know, we should talk about this. Maybe that's another, you know, session where we can talk about that specific uh, um, idea. So so it sounds like you know from from just summarizing our sort of conversation up up to now is that you have you know you have this curiosity driving you and you have this sort of trade off between you know building expertise. That, that you possess, then you can also not only make it useful for one project, but you try to generalize it. You, by generalizing it, 
you're actually creating a method, a methodology that can be yes. used for other fields. Whereas in you know data science, we often maybe would stay on that problem. We solve it, we go to the next problem. We don't maybe package it or generalize it in the way that that you uh, that you uh, uh, described it. So I think that's that's hugely uh, fascinating. And, and perhaps you know one one aspect, and, and maybe that's sort of a side point of of the collaboration between sort of solo and 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 collaborative is that uh, I, I finished reading this book by Adam Grant uh, called uh, titled uh, Give and Take. And it's about different behaviors, like people behaving in different ways. You have very simplified, right? We, we are probably, all of us are in a scale depending on where we are in life, but, but that you have people that usually give more in a collaboration and you have people taking more in a collab collaboration. And then you have a third type, which usually try to match. Oh, you did X amount, I did do X amount. And, and so this is sort of an archetypical characterization of, of human collaboration, and not only in academia, but also across uh, academia. So what's your, you know, usually when you are, like, this is a hard question, I understand, but, but sort of how do you think about this? Uh, it's not a problem necessarily, but it could be a problem, right? If you are a giver <laughs> and then you collaborate with takers and then you, so how, how do you, do, how do you, like, just your thoughts well, on that? A, right, that's, that I would say probably is either number one or number two, the source of unhappiness in, in academia, right? Exactly. <laughs> you, know, you know, all the collaborators, and the other thing is like reflecting like who's first author, who's second author. Exactly. The solution is like for outside the words, now who cares, right? But, exactly. but, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's 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 incredibly hard one. And here, um, I, again, you know, I think I have been lucky in the sense that I, I've been generally um, not have been getting into any serious dispute with anyone. Mm. Uh, but, you know, if I give myself some credit that I, I develop a statistical way of thinking about it. <laughs> Let's hear <laughs> you know, No, seriously, the statistical thinking about it is like, okay, if you take every paper seriously, like, you know, you know, you know the work mm. that we do, right? Mm. Uh, you know, there are some articles, it'd be very clear who is leading, right? The many things are not clear, depending on which dimensions you're, you know, you, which dimension you're working on, right? Yeah. So if, if for every article you spend time trying to measure precisely how your contribution is, yeah. do this, do that, you end up creating lots of unhappiness. You're not being productive. You consume yourself. Right. The way I was thinking about it is is statistical on average, do I get the like you know oh. maybe you know one paper you know yeah. we work at ten paper. Some people you're leading on some papers, right? The, so on the end, in the end, like do statistically speaking, do I get the do everyone you know get their get their credit, you know, credit? Don't worry about the individual variations, right? Yeah, you know, so it's a, an expectation it's a, basically. No, no, right, because that's the way to to yeah. deal with life. Because in the end, it's you know, the you know, the problem is this. There's another issue, because I know this is kind of ironic. Mm. I would say that. Part of the reason people are so hanging on this idea is because they are insecurity, mm. right? Mm. But when someone is very secure, mm. to me now, I'm pretty secure at this point, <laughs> although I often have my own insecurity. <laughs> I don't rely on one, two single papers to build my reputation, to right. heal my scholarship, mm. right? Mm. Okay. So, so no, but, I, but I know this is easy for me to say because I have not have time enough. But, you know, when early on, you, you, you do need to worry about Mm. Uh, uh, this thing because maybe that is your one key paper, right? That, you know, to define you, right? And Job market paper, paper or whatever. So obviously, yeah. which which obviously is tremendously hard. Yeah. So my advice to all the young people mm. when they seek uh, seek uh, seek uh, collaborators, I say do the following homework to find out. Like, and it's not that hard. In, in fact, it was kind of mm. interesting. But people, particularly those with kind of a very is you know centric behaviors they show quickly like you know when they have collaborated right talk to the person do a little bit of reputation kind of a a, a homework to see that do you feel like the person uh only cares about the work or he or she also cares about you being a co-author right mm -hmm. like you know sometimes it's very clear like some collaboration you get into i would tell my collaborate my students say don't get into it sometimes you know you'll be Hide as a consultant, right? Right. Of course, if you, the money you want to pay, that's a different story. <laughs> They'll tell you like you do value, you do this, you do that, right? Exactly. They, they don't talk to you about what they're thinking, what they're saying, right? right? And, yeah. and I think those don't get into it. Yeah. But if you if you can, 
The other thing, sometimes you have people are, uh, uh, you know, quite clear. Like yeah. they, they're very dominant. They, they're very ego to just showcase their work. Right. They, to a point that whatever you do is helping to shining them, not you. And I say, if you can avoid it, avoid it. And then that one actually is not that hard to avoid. Because mm -hmm. people in the department have these, these reputations. You talk to a few students working with these kind of people, they would know. Like they you know, know, yeah. every department, you would know who is much more collaborative. Mm -hmm. I talk to people who is much more, you know. Sometimes you say, hey, I need to work with a guy because I need to learn this part. And right. you will just, you know, take it, right? Yeah, yeah. So you you need to be mindful when you're working back on relationship. I mean, mm -hmm. take take a, a, a not, you know, completely un, unrelated, you know, a, a knowledge. A good collaboration is like a good marriage. Yeah, right? yeah. But, you know, it, it takes a, takes a interest both sides. You have to have love on both sides. It can't be like, you love me and, and you serve me. That doesn't work. <laughs> right? you know, that doesn't work that way. So I would actually really tell the, the younger students to whoever, the young researchers to, yeah. to, do, to do a little bit of homework. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's probably a, a, a trial and error because you know it's hard to. I mean, if it's a famous you know professor, it's probably easy to to understand that or, or or ask and and sort of from rumors deduce um, how that collaboration might might be set up. But if it's a you know um, collaborator, maybe in class or you know a fellow PhD student or or someone in a different department or across disciplines that you don't meet that often, so it's hard to sort of accumulate uh, that knowledge. But I, I guess like what you're also saying here. Charlie, is that you? You know, you could maybe initiate a conversation and then you know figure out where where things are going, and okay. and then you know from there on sort of make make an informed decision about um, uh, the trade offs. If if you want to work with someone who maybe takes more than, than gives, uh, maybe it's worth it because you're learning some skills. But yeah. yeah, yeah, you need to be you need to be informed. Just like you know, you don't want to arrange the marriage, right? Yeah. Even that happened in some country. You know, you right. you, 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 you you really wanted to uh, mm. be informed. The other thing I would say that's really more to to my more senior colleagues, right? Mm. And you know, this is the one I obviously, you know, trying to practice what I what I preach here. Uh, whenever I work with my students, I mm. usually my general principle is that uh, you know I I don't take a first authorship. Mm. We, 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 you know, the only time I take a first authorship, and occasionally you actually. For the fear of the few that you have to do that is mm. let's say sometimes the work is really mostly you know my idea the students mm. maybe sometimes just the mm. mm. students just help out like mm. it, you don't want to send out the wrong signal either right, right, you don't right. want to you know that that paper then people will say well no, that doesn't look right because mm. we saw the he or she's the first also but that didn't really work out right yeah. so you just want that but other than that i mm. usually you know that, that uh, um that, that I let my students, but certainly my PhD mm. students, because mm, uh, mm, mm. they, they do, they certainly deserve it. And, uh, mm, and they, yeah. they also also really, uh, uh, you know, in some sense, really need more than, you know, than I do. Right. right. So, but I do have, it's not like, but I do have principle, right? <laughs> I, I, this is the kind of people you should avoid. Years ago, uh, again, I'm obviously not going to name them. I was yeah. teaching in Chicago. I had an assistant professor from another department to set in my class. Class, and then he got fascinated the fact that, you know, I would ask a question about the missing data mechanism. He said, well, in my field, we just analyze data. We never ask these questions. And he knew there's quite a bit of research that can be done. So he mm -hmm. wanted to work with me. I obviously welcome him. Yeah. But after the first conversation, I decided not to work with him okay. because, uh, you know, maybe he was just being naive or maybe he was that person. I don't know. I was a professor myself at that time. He basically started to come and say, uh, we would like write a paper together, but whatever paper we write, I have to be the first author. <laughs> wow! <laughs> now, I I do give him the benefit of, of the doubt, yeah, yeah. With being uh, very upfront. But for yeah. me, I was just saying, like you know, that's not really. I mean, I used to have a good example to my students. That's not a good way to communicate if you want anybody yeah. to work with, <laughs> because you obviously <laughs> need to determine about it how much amount of work exactly, exactly. involved. It's yeah. it's like say you know, I'm going to. I always had the first author. I mean. It's interesting that he has that kind of a mentality to 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 declare. Yeah, uh, that's... Uh, which is kind of really interesting. That, uh, but so I basically, you know, I yeah. probably find a way to not continue because yeah, it's not like you know, I probably he's great. I mean, I know he actually um, uh, worked out well. I know he's a pretty famous guy now. Yeah, uh, but but I just feel like 
that kind of behavior is I don't want to endorse. Right, right. Uh, I mean, this is this is the hard hard part of, of uh, you know being in in any. I mean, I think I think this is like comparable with sports or any field that you know strives towards excellence, right? So striving towards excellence is, it, it attracts different personalities, right? For good and bad. I mean, humanity is a is a distribution over personalities, right? Sure. Sure. <laughs> so and so you but you'll probably see more of that. I mean, I don't know if it's something with you know ego rising when you when you early success you get. I don't know what, like, it's, I'm not a psychologist. I shouldn't speculate. But it just, like, it seems like maybe this is wrong, but I would love to hear your thoughts that, that generally, you know, in these top performing schools, Harvard, you know, Princeton and so on and so forth, that you'll have more of that type of, of personalities. And if that's true, how do, you, how do you handle it? How do you, how do you handle it? What, yeah. you know, so. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, well, I do. Well, you don't have to mention names. Right. We can. No, I, 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 well. I won't mention the names. You're you're right. Um, the oh, first, I want to say, you know, as a senior faculty, then basically, you know, you need just to deal with those things as part of your maturity, right? Mm. You know, that's your communication skill and how you deal mm. well, not deal well. That reflects on your personality. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you hear the thing, right? Here's sometimes the, these conflict comes. Mm. Like uh, each of us thinking that we are handling well. Mm. But we are the problem of the other people. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm saying, is so dominating. You know, he's like, this, right. You know, and I'm basically saying, Gary is so dominant. I can imagine Gary. Gary is right. <laughs> Gary is the king of the harvest. So I can Gary say. is the king of Harvard. Exactly. Right. right. So, so, you know, you know, so that kind of conflict, yeah. that, that you just have to deal with it. But I do have a serious advice to the junior faculty or junior mm. research students. Please. Yeah. And that's where this concept of a mentor comes in. Mm -hmm. I think that the mentor, that's where you need to identify a good mentor. Okay. Okay. For example, wherever, you know, I have junior faculty want me mm -hmm. to be mentor. I'm always happy because mm -hmm. I would tell them things like this. I yeah. would help them to say, hey, you know, that guy, you know, just avoid it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I kept that kind of information knowledge you may, may not have. Yeah. Right? yeah. And yeah. that is one thing that a mentor can do for you. Right, uh, right. I mean, it's all informal. No, mm. you know, it's it's all you know. But mm. but it's 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 important for you that just because you don't have experience, you, yeah. you 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 may walk into things you really shouldn't walk into. Right, right. So, so uh, man mentorship is yeah. is one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, it's. I mean, you know, certain personality is inevitable. And the other thing I learned, of course, I had the I I had a great opportunity. Uh, I was given the great opportunity to be mm. a chair, to be a dean. In those positions, then you learn a lot. Yeah, and, <laughs> right. And, and then you learn. Mm. Then you learn really to uh, to always. I mean, in those positions, you need to deliver hard conversations. Yeah, and I'm oh, sure think, yeah. you you will be a dean someday. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can see your. <laughs> move in that direction. Uh, so, so, so you will you will deal with the hard country, but then then you will find right. So I can tell I can tell the secret I have. Yes, but please. I, Secrets are good. No, Secret sauce. Is, this is, this doesn't is, become my theory. Yeah. Um, everyone, everyone had this insecurity in them. That's mm. my general theory. So the thing is, like, usually they become very defensive. Become very saying is because. Mm. Uh, you kind of the conversation or the thing happens kind of just push there that part you just oh, need to avoid it mm -hmm. you just need to avoid it. Mm -hmm. so I, i've been telling my students say you know this shall you have this theory now become everybody's guys look the, the thing is like you know um you know when i was dean right you know mm. everybody assumed the harvard dean knows what he or she's doing mm. but to be honest we don't <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things like there's we never had any training to be department chair to be dean right right you learn on the spot Right, yeah. you, you present yourself as as smooth as you can, right? right? And then you'll be sweating, <laughs> and you'll be asking the previous dean, say, "Hey, how did I do this thing?" Right? <laughs> right? Everybody, everybody has has right. had to, no matter which level are. That right. really gives you a perspective. Now, let me let me share with you this one uh, a saying that I I find it very inspiring. Mm -hmm. You know that famous um, uh, 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 talk show host in the opera in opera, yeah. Over one film. Yeah. But one time I heard uh, one thing, I think somebody was interviewing on Owen Field after she kind of completed her show. I'll say, you know, mm. you, you have interviewed so many people in the world, right? From literally from 
you know, prince present to ordinary people to criminals, like everyone, right? Yeah. What is the one thing in common? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he give he give this uh, this is saying like this is this yeah. my theory of insecurity comes from. Yeah, he said no matter who this person is, they always ask the same question. When everything is done, they always ask the same question. And say, how did I do? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> that's that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. Like we we are. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because why, why would they ask the question if they didn't care? Yeah. They care how they do. Just like I'm going to ask you after. Like, how they do. <laughs> well, I'm going. I'm going to ask you how. <laughs> right, because that means that everybody in the mind they still care. No? Even the dictator, yeah, you know, you, you think of the dictator. Well, they actually still have the yeah. side of insecurity. Mm -hmm. Maybe dictator, yeah. particularly the side of insecurity. Yeah, but potentially. <laughs> right. So that's the one thing that that I find that you know it's it's always uh, this bring to the probably the conversation, the topic we have not talked about that we have implied quite a bit. Which is a communication skill. Communication skills, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's communication skills are absolutely crucial mm. for any collaborative work. Mm. And when I say communication skill, I think I probably use broadly that including interpersonal skills, yeah. teamwork, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. Right. All those things are what I call soft skills. Yeah. And it's very hard to say when you learn them. Right. right? right. And and people ask me, Shadi, how did you? Learn, you know, give talks, tell jokes, write all the stuff. I said, my honest answer is always, I don't know what <laughs> happened. It just gradually happened. It gradually happens. Yeah. So, so part of this emotional intelligence, like learning, you know, how would a person react if you say this, say that, you know, but I mean, we're in, 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 in the heat of the moments just thinking, I, I should probably just say straight what I think. Well, no, probably not. You should <laughs> to think about how it's, how it's communicated, how it, how it might yeah, come across. Right. And so communication is, is to totally, you know, one critical um, uh, component and also leadership. I mean, one, one question, you know, that sort of goes hand communication and leadership is part of the, of the journey that, that we are sort of all uh, on, but, but say, you know, Jolly, this is a thought experiment. If we sort of shift gears and think about that, you are someone who is, um, you know, growing, you know, not, not, not all of us, you know, get the, the, the great privilege to go one of these top, you know, institutions. And so how do you, you know, how do you, uh, if you think about this pursuing excellence and in and, and general, right, we've talked about curiosity, we've talked about, uh, you know, a bit of a chance, find, you know, finding this person, that person, these topics, but, but say that you are, you know, at an institution, you're doing a PhD or, or, or a master's, or even you're an assistant or associate professor, but you're striving towards excellence, and you might not have the exact same resources as you might be presented with at, at some of these institutions. What is sort of your advice to, to them to sort of grow towards excellence in, in this situation? Sure. Um, I think the one piece of advice I can give, and I really practice that, uh, maybe it sounds, you know, a little bit of a counter to the point you were actually asking. I would actually say, don't think too hard the notion of pursuit of excellence. Okay. Uh, let us think grow organically. What yeah. I meant is this. Um, when I uh, when I uh, um, become assistant professor at, at the Chicago at the time, and then when initially I was this you know young faculty, I immediately got like six students mm. and uh, uh, I, I was, wow, and uh, you know, why I'm getting so, so popular. <laughs> and, and, and what happened was I think for whatever reason that uh, the students thought that this is a young professor that who can uh, help me to working on something like you know the the problem might be the problem would be great but easy and the guy would be easy on me or whatever it is right mm. and and and, uh, and in the end what happened was like after half a year almost all students disappeared <laughs> okay interesting <laughs> what, what happened <laughs> because because I I basically told them like you know and I still think that that is the right advice mm. the way I worked. Uh, of course, you want to solve big problem and the problem easy. But I would tell them like, if you want to solve big problem, easy problems, probably it's already solved. If problems are very important and easy to solve, it's not going to wait for you, right? What's important is that so certainly when you start a career, don't focus on the product, focus on the process, focus on. So I will tell them to do something. Like when I start initially do the research, this is actually I learned from my advisor Don Rubin, right? Initially, he gave me a problem, like he was asking me to prove uh, some, some particle rate for the EM algorithm, which is really not that useful because, you know, the algorithm essentially compute, who care about the asymptotic rate when they're running this algorithm? 
Mm. So I, you know, I, I did the all the analysis. I did the stuff. I got the results, and it's not that I'm very, you know, very interesting. Uh, and 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 then I went to see uh, my advisor. I said, Professor Rupin, you know, why did you give me this problem? Like, you know, I did the stuff, and it didn't seem like that interesting. Let's say, mm. and he then he was smiling. <laughs> well, he did that on purpose. He said, now you have a taste, right? You understand. You 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 actually. No, I want you to do something to get you going. Mm. But now you actually you you're showing you have a taste. You know how to select problems. Right, right. right. Okay, so, that's that's so, you know that's good. So I I tell the students is always like choose something you can do. Right, you can do. Mm. You will be surprised when you're doing this thing how many things you'll be learning like the, the organic growth. Mm. Essentially, it's like plant planting a seed. Right, mm. grow something. Don't think about you know plant. I want to grow this the big world tallest mm. the tree. The mm. easiest one to take care of. Well, mm. that would take generations to happen. Yeah, yeah. In some seeds, do yeah. something, right? Yeah. And 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 let things grow. And that's how that's how I work. I mean, I really I can tell you how you know I got into these uh, uh, these problems. Mm. I start with the EML algorithm. Then once I'm doing all the missing data, speculating, mm. then it was not a hard to you know. Don't say, well, now we think about the multiple imputation because it's similar mm. uh, missing a problem. Doing imputation obviously needs some basic modeling. Mm. So I kind of start the basing to see them more seriously. Yeah. Once I know the bathing stuff, you know, the MCMC was coming, so I get into MCMC, right? right? right. So now, once I have the modeling skill, skill the bathing thinking, mm. and combination, well, guess what happened to the bathing thinking? The bathing thinking get me started thinking a lot more philosophically. The right. bathing was frequently that got into fiducial, yeah. right? You, you know, all these thinkings. Mm. And the combination part then get me into all the, uh, you know, MCMC developments. Then I got into the bridge sampling, Pass sampling, the, all these MCMC, uh, uh, unimass, unimass knowledge. Mm. It was interesting that doing the MCMC methodology itself. I realized, together with my colleague Augie Kong, mm. that the way we analyze these uh, uh, Monte Carlo data is are not using statistical methods. Mm. Mm. Why mm. not? So we bring statistical methods into the computation, mm. and then later leads to some other interesting theory. Right. The theory. So the thing is like just really organically grow. Mm. Right. Mm. So, but what I would say is like you know maybe planting a few seeds, mm. uh, you know having two several uh, you know different projects, mm. and mm. that's the way that if one does not work out, you have something else to work out. And right. Then, you know, let the thing, let the thing organic grow. Mm. Finding a good mentor, a, mm. you know, good uh, you know advisor, mm. and one thing at least I think for me now this may not speak for other field. Mm. For statistics, it doesn't really take them that much resources to do good work. Mm. Right, it's about brain to have some access to data, right? And the, the plenty of people wants to give you data, mm. and, uh, <laughs> uh, want to work on, right? And uh, you know, some access to uh, to uh, you know, to computer. Mm. So, right. so was, uh, what's more important is in the environment where you have someone to talk to, yeah, that can give you intellectual feedback. Right. But right. now that sometimes is hard when you're in the local area without any uh, statisticians. Exactly. To, uh, or, or sociologists. But I think now there is a one easier solution to it. Mm. Attending conferences, mm. I would suggest, and identify someone you want to talk to mm. and trying to communicate remotely. I have now people to work with me, mm. are not my own students. Mm. Uh, are from other universities. I and mean, these days, as you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm basically spending most time on you know Zoom. <laughs> Yourself is an example. You, you, you come to me, right? And then we met the thing, then we start to, to work. Exactly. Uh, exactly. So, it's just, uh, um, exactly. so I, I think these days are, I would say, you know, having good communication skills that also help you to go out to attend mm. a conference. I always support my students to go to conference as many as, as they can. This mm. would be, I also tell my, you know, any senior colleagues, whoever has fundings, fund your students, go to conferences, even mm. they're not presenting anything. You mm. never know yeah. what relationship they build. Interesting, yeah. Open their eyes. Right. Okay? right. And that, those are things how the thing is really organic. I mean, it's really, research is really like, mm. like this, this, you know, secret garden or whatever. Right. The thing it will, will really grow. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, I love that. It's sort of a, you know, our ideas, our, our work, our collaborations, it's a, uh, it is organic in the sense that we also, you know, planting seeds is like having a, a garden of, of, of ideas that sort of go in different different directions. And and so I think you know that's a good advice for you know basically to 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 keep on striving, keep on building, but not thinking about oh I should be 
there or there or that institution. I just keep and on those things come as you do, and in, in, uh, that's where the good environment. Mm. Uh, you know, I grew up in a culture where we emphasize that if you're doing good work, mm. people should recognize. I know that may not work in every culture, <laughs> but you know, having a little bit of mentality of that is mm. is good. You, I'm not suggesting that you should not uh, fight if you you are in an environment where you you know there's someone deliberately suppress your yeah your your, your you know uh, achievement and mm. being unfair to you. Mm. Again, having a senior mentor. Mm. Uh, has not necessarily even that senior mm. uh, someone can help you talk to that that you know you know that can help right uh, to, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 and the other thing is like uh, um when you do well and this is a good thing about academia at least in u.s again other country may be difficult and you probably experienced that mm. if you if you're not happy with some university seek out go to somewhere else mm. as long right. as you're doing good work somewhere somewhere you know mm. Uh, mm. these days at, at least for Statistician, data scientists that we're pretty hard. Um, yeah, there, there are lots of jobs open yeah. there. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a terrific advice. And so basically, you know, we we're uh, there's so many topics Sally, that we, you know love to talk uh, to you about, and you know, maybe we're sort of coming to the slightly the end of this session. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, we but, should. We should. Yeah. it's already almost one and a half hour. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. So we we sort of go, but there's so many things here. And and perhaps you know, just firing off uh, a couple of sort of small questions about. Um, uh, I mean the whole micro strategy thing we have, but maybe maybe we should save it. Maybe you want to say something about basically how you how you sort of um, structure you know your day. Like now we're going to just leaving those macro. We're going a little bit into oh. the micro. <laughs> so you know how does it walk us through a typical day uh, that you would take the expectation over a week, a, a day, a month? Like how does it look like? Okay, so I I would tell you how my day goes, but I will make the very clear that people don't don't do what I do. Right, I find it's not very, not very effective. But you know, I have all these habits, so it's hard for me to change. Um, I, you know, typical days I will start with email, so that's the, that's the wrong starting point. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the part of the reason for starting with that is I, you know, have some excuse. I was department chair, I was the dean. Mm -hmm. You want to every day knows what are people waiting for your response. You right. want to like what are the fires you need to put out? What are the things I. I don't like, this is one thing which is, I think it's both, both good trade and bad trade of me. I don't like to make people wait. Mm. So I usually try to answer them as fast as I can. Mm. Because of that, you know, uh, uh, I try to do things, you know, try to take care of those things. Mm. Uh, but but the bad part is like, and this is a, this is a time management is, is really a weak uh, 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 spot in, in my own skills. Mm. I always have this thing, even I say so, I know it's going to happen, but I'm, somehow my mind never changed. I would tell myself, like, let me finish all these emails, then I will have time to work on my research, other things. Right. But guess what happened? You, you find the emails, the more oh, coming, yeah. you keep doing it. And, it, and I, feel, I feel, I do feel a satisfaction if I reply email. I feel, otherwise there's something lingering on my mind. Yeah, yeah, I you know. Even now I'm getting older that I have to have a note to tell myself, what email I have not responded. Yeah. So so and and I feel terrible if I don't respond to people. So that's that's I'm not necessarily say that's a that's a good trait. I know my uh, dear uh, twin brother, academic twin brother Andrew Gelman has this skill. He he will he if you send an email, and it used to be you get a vacation email saying I don't read the email before four four p.m. <laughs> right, I've heard that story. <laughs> and it was true, and um, yeah. I I just could not do it. Yeah, uh, usually I could not do it logistically, but a dean, you cannot say I don't read the email before four p.m. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. is that is that also true? Was that also true in the in the past, uh, Jolly, when you were say an associate or assistant professor? Or, like, could you could, what, time, the demand I, for deep work was probably higher than, than right, that. right. At that time, I definitely start. Uh, I will have uh, uh, more time, but uh, I the way I worked is that. Um, um, well, not this long memory because my memory gets gets a little bit of fade here, bent here. The um, uh, you know, I used to kind of trying to keep the chunk of time, mm. like you know, trying to chunk of time to do do research thinking. I still do. I still love that. I still have uh, you know, the great times if I have half day a day, mm. I can just type thinking. Mm. Doing research, doing things. That's always my right. most enjoyable time. That's why I also write all kinds of uh, 
mm. you know, pieces. Right, right, right. The writing itself can be the kind of block time. And in that, in those days, you would you would still do the emailing in the morning, or you, you try to like do less. I try not to, but I, but I, I you know I tell myself this is a I'm on sabbatical, as you know, mm. which mm. unfortunately is already a month. <laughs> I tell myself like you know sabbatical time, I'm going to do four hours in the morning writing before I do anything else. Right. Guess that. Guess what. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> That's always like a starting tomorrow. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I I think there are people with a lot more discipline than I am, and uh, mm. and I still need to learn. Mm. But I think the general principle here is like you need to kind of set aside the time. Mm. That, uh, mm. But I think the one thing I compensate, maybe maybe I maybe maybe that everybody does that. The mm. one thing I compensate is that particular writing. I spend like when whenever I'm doing something else, you know, I'm on the train, I'm in the on train or fly, in hotel, I'm walking. I'm always constantly in my mind arranging the sentences, thinking mm. about what's the flow. Oh, I see. Okay. How do I do this thing? Mm. And uh, uh, and you know, so so kind of I'm using the time to do to do the thinking. I see. I see. Argument. What is saying? So it's, so, you, you sort of have a rough. You have a rough sense for when your day starts and when your day ends, or you try to have a hard de uh, deadline for this is when the day ends, or just like a well, little. That oh. that part I do really really poorly, which is not good for my house. You know, I'm, I need to be now. I'm old. I need to be careful. I used to be. My working hours usually is old days. Probably I would say ten to two, mm -hmm. two a.m. Not two p.m. Yeah, that's a, uh, say again. So ten to so ten ten, 10, 10 a.m. to two a.m. Oh, usually, oh, like two two two. Oh my god! So it's like a, a big chunk of my god. Okay, okay, that's it. So that's usually that's usually. I mean, usually usually the best time for me to do the kind of my own time thinking mm. is the midnight. Mm. Midnight, and you it's know quiet. I love wine, which we have not talked about. That's another big topic. <laughs> uh, usually at the midnight. You know, my family is everybody's in sleep, and I sit down with with a glass of wine. Mm. Then I find like everything's quiet. Mm. I, I can get a couple of hours really mm. my own time. Right, right. That's I really... can't do that anymore. I mean, just like by twelve now, I'm get too sleepy, <laughs> and, I, and I really shouldn't do that. So right. Uh, so my work habit is really not a good one. But I'm I'm trying to change it. So. I mean, I guess it's part of the, you know, part of the journey that we are on. I mean, it's also depending on where we are in, in, in our sort of career and, and, and what kind of collaborations we are on. Uh, but, but, you know, perhaps, you know, perhaps this is something we could deep dive a little bit more into a, in, in a follow-up conversation about sort of the micro part of it. But, but now, uh, Charlie, maybe, you know, finally we're getting to, to the one, two last questions, which is basically, you know, you uh, are, hopefully you'll have many, many more years to go. Uh, Ultimately, however, you know, human life is 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 finite. So, right. so if you would, if you would, you know, would uh, speculate about, you know, what you would, what your legacy would be or should be, you're hoping for. Uh, could you, you know, could you tell us what would that would that thing uh, would be? Oh, I I think uh, uh, I'm I'm gonna say that that's kind of question. Get yourself into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> kind of boost your ego. Also, sure. Stuff. Like you know, I I I'm I would say that just really honestly, um, I'm happy with what I'm doing, and uh, uh, if if I wanted people to remember anything what I've done, mm. I think I wanted to. Uh, that's what I'm working on now, in a way that I want to, um, uh, I, you know, I want to say it will be something about the person that's done. Serious work, but also have a lot of uh, you know, kind of a lie side, you know, fun side. So the ones that I'm working on, mm. really combining statistics with wine. I'm writing <laughs> a big piece on statistics and wine. I'm, it sounds uh, fascinating. Sure. Yeah, and so you know, you know, some fun, you know, in you know, some fun piece, fun piece for people to read. Mm, mm, uh, mm. And uh, uh, you know, uh, I think if I have any goal here for my profession is to. Help to change the image that statistician the bunch of nerds. Uh, that, <laughs> that I do have in mind. The very, very cool nerds, if, if that's so. <laughs> so yeah, I, I really don't have any uh, serious thoughts in terms. I mean, as you said, right? It's it's well, actually, one thing I'm getting thinking about is not on the human life 
is finite. Mm. The universe is finite. Right. Because you know, I have this wonderful colleague, uh, Avi Loeb, has been writing like crazy. He's writing all these things, telling us like the Earth, the Earth probably has another three hundred million years. You know, mm. I was keep thinking about all these things. Like in the end, you know, does not really matter that much. It's really the process. <laughs> right. right. Right now, that might be too long term thinking, but that's what you know, astrophysicists do, right? right? Their thinking yeah. is, is the you know, the sun will burn, burn out, yeah. I think, in another one billion years or, or yeah. something of that nature, right? And uh, so, it's so, a different you know, having that kind of perspective does help you. Uh, yeah. life is life is tough, as mm. we all know, mm. especially when you're getting old, and also, uh, during the pandemic, mm. it reminds everyone how vulnerable life is. Yeah, right? I mean, this is not a philosophy yeah. point. This is no. really like a daily exactly. thinking you have to have. Yeah. Now yeah. everybody realizes yeah. how vulnerable it is. You just have to. I know it's cliche to say, but I, I think it's a really true essence of life is to really enjoy yeah. what you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a very, it's a very good, good thing. And I mean, that's like a, the, the main thing to sort of take with you when you are on this journey. In the end, you know, you are, you are a, you know, being. You are. You're in a being in a larger universe. It doesn't mean that you are uh, don't have value. On the contrary, it's uh, it's a very yeah. uh, uh, no. Actually, now you do remind because in this piece I'm just finished. I'm happy to send it to you. <laughs> yes, but please. I, but I, but I, I do I wrote one sentence, and I don't mind if people quote me to become my to become my legacy. Well, the the the, the thing is like you know, drinking wine is all about you know you know how when you drink your wine by yourself. Mm. The wine is never as good as you're drinking with friends. Seriously. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because yeah. it's all about sharing the memory. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So so the way the one I wrote, I said, you know, you know, memory lasts far longer when you have multiple copies. Mm -hmm. Right. right. And, and, and so so if you really want to keep your legacy, if you want people to remember you, have as many friends as possible. <laughs> That's a beautiful, beautiful word. That's, beautiful That's word. the only way to keep every one of us, no matter unless you are a few very Mm. Like Einstein will be far remember, all of us will be forgotten in like a few generations, you know, right. if, if you're lucky enough. Right. But the more friends you have, the more you live in other memory. I know it's entirely cliche, but it's entirely the correct thing if you say yeah. that. That's yeah. the only way if you want it. So just enjoy having as many friends as, mm. as mm. possible. Mm. And mm. by the way, you also do some good work. That's 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 fantastic, Jolly. And 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 perhaps you know that that could have been that could have been the the, the final. Uh, statement of of this uh, of this conversation. However, I'm going to give you another one, which is you give okay. me, you give us. It's your ending challenge or a question to the audience. So whoever will listen to this uh, in the end, basically, you know what, you know what other advice would you want to give uh, as as a final sort of piece of of, um, of thought? Well, if you want to say give people a challenge, my final thought, sort of, I'd be just what I just said. Uh, having many good friends is not mm. easy, mm. right? You mm. know, having mm. good friendship is really not easy because mm -hmm. it takes a good personality, right? Mm. You, 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 gotta, you know, there's always a conflict. For example, you can have lots of good collaborators, but then you get into the trouble arguing for the authorship. Right. Then you actually end up ruining the relationship, mm. right? Mm. So I think, you know, it, it ha you have to uh, develop kinds of um i know this has become a longish statement but you, you have to develop a kinds of uh, uh your own how should i put it it's not a philosophy it's mm -hmm. it's it's well it, it is your own living philosophy in the how do you uh you know not being taken advantage of obviously mm -hmm. that's sometimes that's what people worry about yeah but it is at the same time being being generous to uh, to uh, being generous to others right. because ultimately the person benefit from all this thing is is yourself mm. and I mm. really and, and I really mean it mean mm. it mm. and uh, you know I have now so many wine friends all of you know, just because you know <laughs> because ultimately yeah. I'm the one uh, enjoying all these things yeah. right yeah. but if we can all think of that way then the society was really would be better mm. I think that these days we're all feel too insecure. Mm. You know, to have too many concerns, too many worries, mm. and feeling, feeling lonely, feeling isolated, mm. and that's where the friends, uh, mm. friends come in. And I, and I think of, and I think I, I, I know sometimes people have advice. You know, don't mix uh, business with pleasure. Mm. I would say, at least for the academia, we have the luxury that our true friends mm. are also our intellectual partners. Right, and and, and you can really do that. Mm. Mm. 
That's that's beautiful. That's beautiful, Jolly. And I think I think with those words, we uh, you know I, I don't know where, how to summarize this. Stuff. There's so many good gold nuggets uh, uh, across this uh, conversation. So um, thank you very much, Jolly. It's truly a pleasure. And perhaps in the future we'll you know we'll meet uh, again in another conversation, another similar or related topics that we didn't get a chance to cover. Yeah. My suggestion will be one well, next one is when we get together, you can do record when we both start drinking and the chatting. How about that? <laughs> that sounds perfect. That's a promise, Jolly. Thank you very much. Sure.